Hello everyone, I'm Charlotte. And I'm Dina. Welcome to The Grim Curriculum. First of all, thank you so much for your messages and comments about last week's episode. Honestly, we're really, really glad you guys enjoyed listening to it as much as we love doing that episode. And it, we know a lot of you are really excited for today's uh, Die Out Love Pass Incident Part 2. According to some of you, we left you on a little bit of a cliffhanger last week, didn't we? I, I guess kind of, yeah, yes. we did. <laughs> so last week, we introduced our team of nine doomed hikers that would all die mysteriously while hiking in the Ural Mountains of Russia. Their bodies were found with various injuries that could not be explained, and their deaths would be ruled to be caused by, quote-unquote, a compelling force of nature. Many people were not convinced by this explanation. Not only were the injuries strange, the entire area around them left a puzzling scene that would lead to this being one of the most famous unsolved mysteries of our time. That is until last year when new data showed that we likely now know what caused the nine hikers to cut through their tents in the middle of the night and run out into the woods to their eventual deaths barely even dressed. Or so they say. Exactly. So today we're going to be discussing some of the theories that stood out to us the most while we were researching the episode, and we'll also be talking about the newest information regarding the case. And we're also going to be sharing the story of how this almost happened, again, almost 60 years to the day. Yeah, so just uh, sit and ruminate with that one for a second. We have a lot to go over today, and we are very excited to get this one started. So like we mentioned last week, some of the theories really do make a lot of sense. Others are certainly a bit more out there. We're going to be exploring this with an open mind as we always try to do, uh, but like we said, some of them are super uh, fun. Absolutely. So with that being said, we are going to start off by asking the age-old question. Was it aliens? Always a very valid question when it comes to right. anything, but we actually have some very interesting reports from around the time of the incident from various groups of other hikers. Apparently, another group of hikers was camping about 50 kilometers south of where the Dyatlov group was. They reported seeing bright orange spheres in the sky. And they weren't the only ones. Similar reports were made between February and March by numerous people, including the military, meteorology services, and of course regular people, both in and around Ivdel. The majority of these witnesses did not speak up at the time, but they did come forward years later. And I mean, we can't really blame them. I look at how people would look at you now for blaming aliens on something, let alone back in Russia in 1959. I think you might, especially in Russia in 1959, right? Might have been sent out to Siberia, good day, never see you again. And you're a troublemaker if you believe in aliens, you're going away now. Exactly. So here, if it wasn't already, it's where it gets really interesting. So last week we mentioned Lev Ivanov, who was the chief investigator of the incident. He was the guy who ended up having all the photos years later. So he noticed something really interesting in his original reports. He said that the trees in the area had been burned at the top. Apparently, he was even given drawings made by the local Mansi hunters of the sightings, but he was forced to get rid of them. He was interviewed in 1990, 31 years after the incident by a small newspaper. He said, I suspected at the time, and I'm almost sure now, that these bright flying spheres had a direct connection to the group's death. He also said in the interview that while he did believe this, even in 1959 when it happened, he was not allowed to explore his theory any further. He claimed that censorship and overall secrecy was what stopped him from going any further. I find it very interesting that the chief investigator of something this serious would not only feel this way about it in regards to it being something otherworldly, but also that he believed in it enough to openly talk about it years later. Like, mind you, this was an interview conducted in another country, so he may have felt more comfortable talking about it, but I feel like he must have really, really, truly believed in this if he was willing to go that far. Well, I think often around, like, the Chernobyl incident in Pripyat, at how like the people that were there were not allowed to talk about it like do not say anything exactly it only came out much later what like truly happened and all the actual like details of it so like in the in the cold war in russia keeping your mouth shut is yeah. kind of like your day-to-day -day. exactly and we talked about it last week but the diaries and all of that didn't become public until 2009 yeah so, so from he, decades yeah after. exactly so it's not like he would have just like been saying this just for shits and giggles oh, like no. he had to have really meant it because that's his career on the line potentially and to hold on to it yep. years later too to finally come out with it exactly right? 
So other members of the investigation team also appear to have become obsessed with UFOs throughout the rest of their lives. So he wasn't the only one. Exactly. So skeptics, they do say that some of these interviews were given for money, and that's all nonsense. But at the end of the day, you can't deny that there were people directly involved in this case that fully believed that UFOs were present near the hikers that night. So what could that mean? Well, it could definitely mean a few different things. First and foremost, the theory that they simply just saw something in the sky and it caused them to run out of their tents to go look at it. I mean, that's one, but it doesn't explain the state of the tent. You're right. Like we mentioned, the tents, they were cut open from the inside, which leads us to believe that whatever made the group run out of the tents must have really been terrifying. So did they actually see a UFO or aliens? Did aliens make contact? We don't know. What makes the whole strange lights in the sky theory even more interesting is the fact that 12-year-old Yuri Kuncevich, who attended some of the hikers' funerals, reported that five of the hikers had a deep brown tan. And yes, this was the eyewitness report of a 12-year-old kid, but apparently he was not the only one that said this. The really interesting thing about this young fella is that he grew up to be the head of the Ekaterinaburg-based Dyatlov Foundation. Listen, you guys know how I feel about aliens and that kind of stuff by now, but at this point, other hikers have reported lights, the chief investigator and other high up members of the investigation have also reported lights. Now we have these reports in the funerals, not to mention the strange burns on the tops of the trees. I'm not going to say I'm like sold on this theory, but I find all of those things together fascinating to say the least. Speaking of things in the sky, there was another theory regarding the strange lights in the sky that night. While it is incredibly rare, lightning can happen in the cold. One of the theories about the lights is that they were ball lightning. Ball lightning is an unexplained phenomenon that, while rare, has been cited by many throughout history. It's been described by witnesses as a luminescent, spherical object. It has been reported to be anywhere from the size of a pencil eraser to several meters long. Ball lightning has been reported to move in a number of ways, including up and down, side to side, and also frantically through the sky. Scientists have put forward a number of explanations for this phenomenon, but it's still not fully understood. Something like that in the sky could definitely draw the attention of the hikers and lead them to look outside, but it still doesn't explain why they cut themselves out of the tent. Exactly. So that's where the second part of this theory comes in. What happens when ball lightning hits something? The lightning could have hit numerous spots, and this would explain some of the burns on the treetops, as well as a few of the stranger injuries found on the bodies. Lightning can generate a ton of heat, so something like this would do a lot of damage, especially to huge piles of snow and big trees. Not only that, it would be more like a giant explosion due to the sheer amount of power in the lightning. It could have hit different areas around around the campers as they ran for safety, injuring them all and either killing them instantly or killing them as they try to run for help or find their friends. Somehow, like, that whole idea is almost scarier to me than the idea of it being aliens. I think the, like, anything to do with, like, a freak weather... Oh my god, yeah. It's very scary because it can be incredibly unpredictable and, like, these guys, even if they saw it, probably didn't know what that was. No, I I think the average person even now, if they saw something like that, they'd be like, what the hell is that? And you're in the middle of nowhere. I mean, I'd never heard of ball lightning before the Diet Love Pass theory. So, and I've certainly never seen it. So I don't know. It's... I'm gonna sound like the coolest person on the planet oh, right now. Yeah, I know, I know. I've, <laughs> <laughs> I've watched a ton of videos about it, and I've seen some... I, I listened to a podcast that talked about it once, too, and it's an interesting phenomenon. You can see the pictures, and it's, it's one of those things that when I was kind of looking at this myself, I tried to picture, like, how would I react if I saw this in the sky and I had no clue what it was, I, and <laughs> it would be... I would think it was aliens. I would probably lean towards, like, aliens or, like, fey creatures. Like, yes, some kind of, yes. like, fairy trying to lead me into the forest. Yeah, that's not like a weather thing to me. No. That's a monster coming from the fucking sky totally. as far as I'm concerned. Maybe I just play too much Dungeons and Dragons. I don't know. <laughs> you know, probably, yeah. I feel like that might have a lot to do with it for us, but like at the same time, like it's, you wouldn't think it's like, oh, that's lightning. D- totally. Yeah, it doesn't look anything like it. No. If you're sitting there hearing this and thinking to yourself, wow, this sounds kind of nightmarish, well, you'd be absolutely right. This really wasn't just a run-of-the-mill hiking accident. Whatever happened here is still talked about for good reason, and I think so much of that is because of the extent of the injuries. Definitely. We have so many photos of them on the beginning of the trip where they're smiling. We talked a lot about it last week. They look happy, and then you get to the photos that the investigators took. It's haunting. The The pictures are out there if you'd like to dive into it further, but the autopsy photos get pretty graphic, it's, just as a heads up. The, the photo of Ludmila is, in my opinion, among one of the most shocking I've ever seen, and we've come across some pretty rough stuff in our research, yep. so like, that's saying something. <laughs> Absolutely. 
The next set of theories is a little more um, down to earth, so to speak, but also explores some rare natural phenomenon that could have caused the hikers to lose their lives. And they both have to do with wind in the area. We know from the diary entries that there was a fair bit of wind during some of their hike, but that isn't exactly a surprise or anything. You're on a mountain, you're hiking, it's gonna get windy. In 2013, Donny Icar wrote in his book, Dead Mountain, that the wind in the area produced something called a Carmen Vortex Street. And those are neat because you can actually see them in the sky when they're happening. A Carmen Vortex Street is an infrasound produced by the wind that can cause pretty severe reactions in some humans can cause anything from discomfort to paranoia to full-blown panic attacks. In his book, Icar claims that the hikers succumb to a panic state due to this and that it caused them to leave their tents as quickly as possible and begin to flee. Once they got further away from the sound, the feelings of panic began to go away. Unfortunately, at this point, it was too late and the campers were too far from their tents to be able to return safely. It was pitch black out, and it is possible that they were turned around, lost, or maybe just unable to see anything. This would have led to some of them eventually succumbing to the cold, while others could have injured themselves by falling. And that wasn't the only way that the wind could have killed them, which, like, what a horrifying sentence. <laughs> like, that's how scary all of this is, you guys. Wind, wind, I will go on record to say wind is my least favorite kind of weather, because... It's not pretty to look at. It's not awe-inspiring. It's just destructive. Yeah, that's you know, like accurate. a thunderstorm yeah. can be pretty awe-inspiring. A rainbow, beautiful rain. It's good for the land. Then you got wind, and then it's wind fuck shit up. just fucks it all up. Seriously, like okay, think about how many things could have potentially killed them out there, though. Like that the wind had numerous ways to kill them. Like I'm again, I'm reminded of how carefree they were at the beginning, and now we're here. This freak accident. Yep. Like I, I'm not sure what the odds of this are happening. But it has to be ridiculously small. Absolutely. In 2019, a Swedish-Russian group journeyed to the site and began to investigate the weather phenomena in the area. Their theory was that a violent catabatic wind could have been what caused all of this to happen. This, again, is an incredibly rare thing to have happen, but when it does, it can easily leave death and destruction in its path. These winds can be incredibly violent. So this actually did happen in 1979. A group of Swedish hikers were out in the Anaris Mountains when they were hit by catabatic winds. This resulted in the deaths of eight hikers and another was injured critically. The theory is that when the wind started to hit, it was so strong that the hikers could not safely stay in their tents. Because they didn't want their tent to blow away, they covered it in up in snow and made their way to the trees where they thought they'd be safe. Some reports say that a torch was found near the top of the tent after it collapsed, which suggests that they could have intended to use it to find their way back. But, as we know, they weren't able to find their way back, and instead, it's possible that they died either from the elements or due to their makeshift shelters collapsing on them because of the wind. The main thing to remember here is the sheer level of experience and training that this group had. That is something that we keep reminding you guys because we want you to understand that the group knew what to do in case of emergencies. And we mean it. Look at the youngest member of the group, Ludmilla. She was only 20 when they embarked on their trip and she was buried on her 21st birthday. Only two years before the incident, Ludmilla was on another hiking expedition in the eastern Sayan Mountains. During this trip, she was accidentally shot in the leg by a hunter. Not only did she survive this incident, she actually felt really bad for the inconvenience of the situation and was mostly upset because she would not be able to complete that hike. She was taken to medical care, which would prove to be an arduous and painful journey in itself, and she later recovered. And she continued to hike after she healed from being shot. These were incredibly tough people, you guys. She essentially got shot, the situation got handled, and in the end, she was fine. Again, they knew how to handle themselves if things went bad. I'm just trying to do the math in my head. If she was 20 when they were hiking, and this was 1959, she would have been born right smack in the middle of World War II, would she not? Yes. And so, you know what? I feel like that in itself just breeds a different kind of human being. You know what? There is... Um, a resource online that talks about the hikers before all of this happened mm -hmm. and they talk about her and they talk about like all the stuff she accomplished I and like ya. all these things that these guys did by like the age of like 20 21 and i'm just like sitting there reading it and i'm like well shit i know it's <laughs> it kind of makes you feel a little bad about yourself yeah honestly. i'm just like damn these guys are out there doing stuff i guess the the silver lining of that is that although they all obviously perished well before their time was due in my opinion at least they had lived a pretty eventful lead up to that yeah you know, they got to see things that maybe other kids 
their age wouldn't have been able to see. They were a very adventurous group of people, for sure. But honestly, Yudmila, bad bitch. Oh yeah, 100%. So... All of that makes this so much more of a mystery. Whatever happened would have had to have been enough to take the hikers completely by surprise and forget all of the safety precautions that they normally would have taken. Again, some of these were as simple as wearing proper clothing when they ran out of their tent, most of whom were not. So far we've covered unknown lights, mysterious flying objects, and various ways the wind can make you die, but we (laughs) haven't covered another terrifying fact could have been other people. So you may again find yourself thinking, well, they're on a pretty deserted mountain. How could other people possibly get to them? And that's fair. At first, it was theorized that maybe an escaped convict from a nearby labor colony could have had a run-in with the hikers, but there were no known breakouts around this time. It was actually also assumed for a period of time that the group could have been mistaken for an escaped group of convicts and killed on site, but there isn't really a lot of evidence that actually suggests that. No, because I feel like that would have been reported, and like... They would have covered that shit right up. That's when they would have said it wasn't that, it was a Yeti. Or like when they found them, they would have had like gunshot wounds. Exactly. You know, like it just doesn't really add up in that way so what else could it have been something that stands out from the diaries is the ever-present topic of the mansi people the mansi people are an indigenous group local to the area they are a semi-nomadic group of people who hunt and fish in the mountainous areas of russia they are mentioned in the diaries in a few different ways the group spend a fair bit of time learning some mansi words and they kept records of this in their diaries they also speak about following mansi signs and trails up the hike Something about the Mansi people is that they are very proud and that the mountains are sacred to them. It was theorized that they possibly could have done something to offend them, which caused an altercation. Something like this could explain some of the injuries. Like we mentioned last week, one of the hikers, Rustam Slobodin, had injuries that appeared to have been caused by another person hitting him in the head. So could this be what led to such a gruesome injury? However, as we know, unfortunately, it is all too common for minority groups to be used as scapegoats. There is enough evidence to prove that the Mansi people were not involved. First and foremost, they are known to be a peaceful people, and the mountain was considered by many to be a shared place as long as people respected it. They were allowed to go there and enjoy it. There were also no tracks or anything like that to prove that another party had arrived at the scene and interacted with the hikers other than those injuries we mentioned a moment ago. But at the end of the day, for all we know, those could have been done by another hiker. So just because the Mansi people weren't involved doesn't mean that we can completely omit other people from our list of theories. You're absolutely right. So let's look at a pretty big group of people, the military. Before we talk about the military, we just want to quickly remind you guys that some of the injuries could make this theory plausible. First and foremost, the radiation. The final two bodies to be found were Semyon and Ludmila. The autopsy report states that the waistband of Semyon's sweater and the lower part of his pants tested positively for radioactivity. The sweater that Ludmila was wearing also tested positive, so why? Why would two people out in the middle of the Ural Mountains test positive for radioactivity? And I don't know if this matters, but to me I think it's worth pointing out. I think it goes without saying that Yudmila bore probably some of the worst injuries out of the group, Yeah, right? I think that's pretty undeniable. The photos of the bodies are haunting, but the photos of her, again, some of the most shocking things I've seen in a long time. But what I wonder is, is there a reason that the people with the most extreme injuries were the ones who tested positive for radioactivity? So, Semyon's injuries were bad as well, so did they find something? Ooh, as much as I hate to say it, did something find them? What could leave a body like this? There is a theory that where the group decided to sleep that night was within a path of a Soviet parachute mine exercise. A parachute mine is a naval mine that's dropped by an aircraft by parachute. That sounds incredibly Looney Tunes to me. Yeah, it kind of does, doesn't it? Do you know what I mean? Yeah, oh yeah. (laughs) Why? Wiley Coyote is piloting that plane. Absolutely. These mines are a bit different because they detonate while they're still up in the air rather than when they hit the ground, so they're an air burst. And that right there is the key point. So could the group have heard the explosion and run out of the tent as quickly as possible? This certainly would be enough to scare a person awake and even cause the most experienced person of the group to panic. This could have caused the group to run towards what they thought was safety, but they could have gotten lost because they were poorly dressed and it was pitch black. 
this would have been enough for some of the first campers found to have succumbed to the cold. However, can it explain some of the other injuries? I mean, I think it looks like it can. Parachute mines can absolutely cause severe internal injuries without a ton of external trauma. This is a huge level of sheer force and the kind of damage that it can cause to a human body definitely does compare to at least some of the injuries found on them. This also could explain the strange orange orbs in the sky that were seen that night in and around the area. So the idea of it being a weapons test actually makes a fair bit of sense because it ties in with a few of the other theories that we talked about and it possibly does discredit them. Absolutely, because I mean, you hear the bang, you're like, holy shit, what was that? You run out of your tent, you see the glowing lights, it all kind of adds yep. up with the parachute Absolutely. mines, right? It's been theorized that the weapons test could have been of a radioactive nature, which could explain, of course, the radioactivity on two of the bodies. But then it gets confusing because why only two of the bodies? Exactly. This is exactly why when we do our theories episodes, we always want to encourage others and ourselves to fully explore the topics. It's happened so many times where we read a certain theory, get so convinced, but then it comes to the end and then we find that reason for doubt. And that to me is what makes these kind of episodes really fascinating. Some people also believe that this could have caused the discoloration of the hair and skin on the hikers' bodies. However, this can also be explained by cold and wind. Basically, their bodies were preserved pretty well due to the severe weather conditions. The autopsy reports describe them as mummified. Nasty. Yeah. Awful. Yeah. Many civilians were suspicious about how secretive the government was being about the incident. This fueled the rumors that the military could possibly be involved. The story was suppressed pretty heavily, and people were often discouraged from even talking about it. And while this may seem super suspicious to some of you, it actually isn't. This is just how it was in Russia in those days. It was standard for the government to conceal information about incidents that happened in the country. There's some serial killers from that area that I really want to cover in the future. Uh, one of the things that comes up a lot in these cases is how much the government hid from the people in regards to crimes that were happening and how that actually aided some serial killers and allowed them to be active for decades in Russia. We see this with people like Andrei Chikatilo. Oh, yeah. Notorious of just decades. going Absolute through it. decades because it wasn't being reported. Exactly. By 1980, the majority of the information was released to the public. And like we said in the last episode, the diaries were released to the public in 2009. We do also just want to take a second and very quickly dispel a somewhat popular theory that this was the result of an animal attack. So this area has a population of wolverines. And those little bastards are some of the most vicious little fighters you will ever come across in the animal kingdom. Oh yeah. I would honestly rather come up against a grizzly bear than a wolverine. Straight up. Absolutely. These things are mean. Seriously, like you said that, but a 30 pound wolverine can take down a full grown bear in a lot yes. of incidents. They fight their prey by biting down and clawing them and their jaws are powerful enough to crush a bone. They can also, and I didn't know this until this episode, they can spray like a skunk when they're mad. So really, like insult to injury with these little things. It's not somebody, <laughs> like not a critter you want to run no, into. No, Anyone that knows me knows, like I have a huge fear of bears, you guys. Like real we life. We live in Canada. Yeah. It's a possibility. It's, it's a real fear. Absolutely. Real life, video games, movies, whatever. I will go on record saying I would rather run into a bear than a hungry wolverine. And both of those are just like an absolute nightmare to me. So all that being said... Do you think it's possible that a wolverine or some other animal was drawn to the hikers because of the noise or maybe the smell of food and then attacked them? Could it have tried to break into the tent which caused the hikers to panic and cut their way out the other side? This could explain why they didn't return to the tent. Maybe they were scared that it would come back. But there weren't any tracks visible when the bodies were found. But that doesn't mean there weren't any there at some point and got covered up by the snow. However, no other evidence was found to suggest an animal attacked them while they were still alive. That being said, an animal could explain some of the more gruesome injuries found on the campers, especially the missing eyes and tongue. That's exactly it. So just a little warning, guys. We're going to get gross here for a second. Realistically, if an animal eats a dead human body, they will most likely go first for the softer flesh, like the eyes, mouth, cheeks, and the tongue. While an animal may not have killed the group, that doesn't mean that there weren't any visiting afterwards. Before we talk about our final theory, we want to add, I guess what we can call an honorable mention. Yeah, that's right. It's time to talk about our friend, the Yeti. I've talked a lot about this in our cryptid episodes, but I love my giant monsters Aww, and I definitely I, yes. enjoyed researching this part of the episode, but oh my god, some of it was 
painful. So Dina was... She, oh, she I went was, on a rant before we started recording today, you guys. I have a lot to say about uh, this. She bit the bullet, and uh, in 2014, a Discovery Channel special by the name of Russian Yeti, The Killer Lives, Jesus Christ. Mm-hmm. Uh, so they attempted to find out once and for all if a Yeti was what killed the hikers. So I didn't watch the whole thing. It is almost two hours long. I don't long. blame you. From, just from what you were telling me before yeah. we started. Yeah. I, I probably watched more than I should have. Like, first and foremost, <laughs> I don't agree with the fact that they used a lot of the autopsy photos, especially Ludmila's. They used them in the documentary in this certain way that was, honestly, it was super disrespectful. Yeah, they what, were meant yeah. to shock you. It was, it literally showed her face and it was like, what could have mutilated her body in such a way? I could it that. have been the Yeti? And it's like an up close picture of her face missing its eyes and tongue and screaming. I'm, I'm like, all for getting as much information, oh. you know, like, obviously we do a lot of research into some really dark and morbid yeah. topics. Some things come up, and some of them it is educational and evidence, but in this case... There's a right way and a wrong way yeah. to do this, you guys, and when it comes to true crime or talking about victims in any way, like... There's like I said, there's a right way and a wrong way, and showing her face and asking if the viewer if a yeti could have mutilated it is not so great. Like it's honestly, if if you have two hours of your life that you want to waste and never get back, it's on YouTube. Yeah, if um, you've got some kind of you're feeling some kind of way and you yeah, need something to be mad at, but like go watch like Balto instead. Like honestly, go, go watch don't. like Harry and the Hendersons. Yeah, <laughs> like, just I mean, this is there, it's out there, and it's um. Basically, all that to say, the documentary gets to the end, yeah. and they say, oh, we don't really know what happened. That's what pissed me off the most. It's two hours later, and they're still just like, it's, well. It's just mm-hmm. sensationalized bullshit at the the sake of, not the sake, at the expense of a victim. like Absolutely. Of a tragic, tragic accident, or whatever. So, they claim that nothing else could have possibly left the hikers with such terrible injuries and that based on all of that information they're sure it was a yeti they especially pushed on it when it came to yudmila the missing tongue is something that they mentioned again and again and again there's also the infamous Dyatlov Pass Yeti photo. All right. Now, we've shared some pretty glorious cryptids photos with you guys. So this is another one that we're, we're going to put it up on our socials. And if you're watching on YouTube, it'll come up right away for you. It's a classic. So the Yeti photo. This is a photo that was found on one of the cameras. People who believe in the Yeti theory often claim that this photo proves that without a doubt, the group not only encountered the beast, but the photo of it was one of the last ones taken. The photo depicts a dark figure standing amongst the trees as if it was peering out. We will let you guys be the judge of this one because, uh, yeah, it's something else. It is. We do want to point out that while they couldn't prove that it was a Yeti, it is one of the actual photos from the cameras, and it does have a bit of a strange feel to it. It doesn't look anything like the other photos, which are either kind of more posed or just like the group members doing things. We said we were going to go into this open-minded. Yeah, we, we did. And we love a good cryptid. We do. However... There just really isn't a lot of evidence here other than the fact that someone wanted to make a documentary. And you guys, if the Yeti is real, he is disappointed that he was used like this. Absolutely. He did not consent to this. No. So, we've talked about UFOs, weapons test, we got the Yeti, we got escaped convicts, wind, and more. So now it's time to get to the final and most widely accepted theory. An avalanche. Avalanches do happen in this area, but it is very uncommon. The diaries talk about light snow cover overall, with the exception of the last few days. One of the theories is that an avalanche occurred while the hikers were sleeping in their tents. This caused the tent to collapse and be partially covered in snow, which could have caused the hikers to panic in an attempt to get out to safety. This could not only explain them cutting their way out of the tent, but it also could explain the lack of clothing that they left with. The only thing about this theory that makes it a little bit confusing is that they ran out of the tent, and we can see that with the footprints, but they also slowed down a fair bit once they headed to the forested area, so they weren't running for their lives the entire time. If it was an avalanche, you would assume that they would have run more and further. Unless maybe they just didn't want to cause another one. 
This theory makes a lot of sense on paper, but it's kind of another one where the more you dig into it, the less you start to believe it, which is exactly how I feel about this one. The bodies were found under a fairly shallow layer of snow, and if an avalanche had occurred before their deaths, or even after, they would have been at least somewhat buried. Not only that, but there's no physical evidence of an avalanche actually taking place. Now, the strangest thing is that when a team investigated the terrain of the area, they noted that if an avalanche had happened, it likely wouldn't have hit their tent. It wasn't in a path that was at risk. Exactly. And again, they're experienced hikers. Dyatlov himself was an incredibly skilled skier, and he wasn't the only one. Semyon even taught skiing and hiking. Both of them, along with the rest of the team, knew enough about where they were that it would be a safe place to place a tent and to know not to place it somewhere that would be at risk of being crushed by an avalanche. But if that has you convinced... The families wanted more answers even years later, and between 2015 and 2019, investigators from the Investigative Committee of the Russian Federation confirmed that an avalanche could have happened. They were able to confirm that the weather that night was absolutely horrific, with winds that were described as hurricane force and temperatures racing to minus 40 Celsius. The information was missed in the original investigations because they saw that the weather was quite nice when the bodies were found, and they didn't consider it a possibility. They claim that the group set up their tent, but that it wasn't near any natural barriers which didn't protect it when the snow began falling. The group dug the site for the tent, which caused the snow around them to weaken. New snow caused the tent to be pushed further into the snow they dug and trapped them in the tent. They panicked and cut themselves out and ran towards safety. At this point, the group split up and the first two died of hypothermia. Three hikers tried to get back into the tent but failed and succumbed to either the cold or their injuries. The remaining hikers tried to build a small fire and shelter, but they likely fell into a large hole that had been formed near a stream. As we mentioned, some of the remaining injuries to the bodies could have been done by animals post-mortem. The ICRF stated that the weather, along with poor planning, caused the team to choose a dangerous place to camp and that splitting up doomed them further. They talk about how basically this happened because Igor Dyatlov chose a bad spot and therefore his lack of experience got the group killed and i have a really I, hard time believing make that sense. humans are humans and we make mistakes but i just struggle with this because everything else that we read says we that he knew what he was doing like to me it just seems like they needed someone to blame so they just blame the leader of the group but this all brings us to the newest information that we have available. In 2021 new studies were done to either prove or disprove the avalanche theory a pair of scientists from Switzerland have actually put together a ton of evidence that might prove that it was an avalanche after all. But not just any avalanche, a slab avalanche, which in case you haven't heard of it, is a type of avalanche that forms in snow that has been deposited in an area by wind. It looks like a block, hence the name, and it can occur on low angled slopes like the one they were on. The two scientists, Alexander Puzren and Johan Gom, published this study and were met with quite a few skeptics. People truly either didn't want to believe that it was an avalanche that could have killed them, or they just didn't think that it was possible for them to actually happen there. Alexander and Johan continued to gather evidence and even made the trek numerous times. One of their trips was during similar weather conditions that the hikers experienced, and they were actually able to capture a slab avalanche happening on camera in the area where they died. They do admit that this doesn't explain all of the injuries and the overall strangeness of the scene, but it proved something that many believed was not possible. Avalanches did happen there. Not only that, but slab avalanches can create a lot of pressure that is triggered by a relatively small event. They theorized that the noise they made pitching their tent could have set off a series of events that triggered the fatal avalanche. On January 28th of this year, two experienced mountain guides named Oleg Demenyenko and Dmitry Borisov noted that during their trip to the pass, the wind went from completely fine to so strong that it was almost overturning their snowmobiles. Not only that, they could barely see where they were going. When the weather improved, they were able to see evidence of two more slab avalanches happening in the area. They also said that these type of avalanches tend not to leave a ton of evidence behind because the slab tends to vanish under snow quickly. This could be why there was no actual evidence of an avalanche happening at the time. And a lot of the other theories that we talk about, they had me convinced for a bit but this one stands out because every time I think it wasn't an avalanche, I read more about why it makes the most sense. Well, unfortunately, it doesn't explain the radioactivity, burns on the trees, and strange lights. We have an answer here, kind of, but at the end of the day, not everyone is convinced. I feel like it's more likely that it was 
maybe more than one event happening at the same time. It could have just been a really, really An absolute bad night. Freak night. Like they like, were sleeping in the tent. They heard a boom. They looked outside. There were lights in the sky. They looked on the ground. There was a Yeti chasing them. And then an avalanche. And then an avalanche came. But the army, they tried to get the Yeti too. So they set off a a pipe mine or a parachute mine. Yeah. And then all of that happened. I mean, (laughs) we don't know what happened here. No. And, And you know what? I don't know if we ever will. The only people who could explain it to us are the people that were there that night. And unfortunately, they did not live to tell the tale. Exactly. And that's that, the Day Out Love Pass incident. A truly unreal story, and we are so excited to have been able to share it with you. I really hope we did it justice. I think we did. I think I really hope we did, too. Honestly, this case is something that truly stays with us, and we both wonder if, if we're ever going to see an actual answer here. Some would argue that we have. I, I want to believe it was a slab avalanche, because that gives us an answer. <laughs> It finishes the story and we get closure, but at the end of the day, I'm really not sure. We don't have a lot of these questions answered. And I think that's why we're still talking about this to this day. Well, I have to say it was probably one of the first sort of true crime mysteries that really grabbed my attention because it wasn't the usual like serial killer kind of thing. And the more I got into it, the more I think it probably was a slab avalanche, but like I mentioned before, I think it's more likely at this point that it was more than one event occurring at the same time. Like maybe maybe they were testing these parachute mines and that's what caused the avalanche to dislodge and come screaming down, right? Yeah. Like and maybe or you know, maybe it was UFOs that caused an avalanche. Like I it's so hard to say, but the slab avalanche thing does ring true for me. I, I, think. I really like your theory of it being two things because you're absolutely right. If if a slab avalanche can be triggered by something potentially as little as them just pitching the tent, what the fuck is an yeah. explosion gonna do? Oh, for sure. And I've seen a real avalanche before and it's the the might of it, like the sheer force of it, like and you hear it, it's like thunder. Oh yeah. So it's crazy. And we would love to know which theories stand out to you guys. Are there any that we didn't mention that you think we should have? Let us know. I'm sure there's tons. I think we've only just scratched the surface here. Today, a memorial remains with the names and photos of the hikers, and the area has been named to the Dyatlov Pass. The story has received international attention for decades, and it truly has just been a part of true crime history, I think. Uh, Especially to folks in that area. Very much so. To the point where just last year, nine hikers vanished at the Dyatlov Pass again. You heard that right. This happened again. So this particular group, mostly from Moscow, learned of the doomed voyage and decided to try it out for themselves. They wanted to find the area and pay their respects. However, they did not check in when they were supposed to, and it didn't help that they didn't properly alert the right authorities when they were going on this trip. So basically no one knew that they even went, really. So don't do that, you guys. Please let people know where you're going. Especially if it's on a hike in the mountains where people tend to disappear. Absolutely. Luckily, the group was found safe. They claimed that they ran into issues with the weather, surprise, surprise, and that they couldn't continue. Luckily, they did not meet the same end as the hikers did back in 1959. This probably won't be the last time a group tries to take this trip and runs into problems. We only hope that, unlike the Diet Love group, that they all return unharmed. I believe um, that also they literally say, if you're going to go do this trip, to not do it in a party of nine. That's that's a very good point. Yeah. Yes, that's absolutely true. They say uh, like don't you can do have that. eight, you can have ten, whatever. But Just you not nine. Nine is obviously unlucky. I oh, what a story. Like I oh my god, I hate the cold. I hate the cold <laughs> so much. I have had incredibly severe frostbite um, to the point where I have nerve damage in my ears. Jesus, um, I have experienced hypothermia firsthand. It, it's not something to mess with you guys like it is probably this was when i was 18 it was one of the scariest things i've ever experienced the idea of dying up in a mountain like this and just being frozen up there scares the absolute crap mother out of me. nature she don't fuck around you don't fuck with if you nature. fuck around with mother nature you're gonna find out quickly absolutely i i also hate the cold which is hilarious 
coming from the UK to Alberta. And when we did emigrate and we landed here in 2002, it was January 2002. So real like uh, culture shock there. When we were originally, this is so off topic guys, when we originally were getting ready to move to Canada, we were told by a lot of people that the roads here are heated so that there was never an issue of ice or snow on the roads. They did you so dirty. I know. I know. <laughs> I know they do that for um, like uh, airports, like runways yeah. and stuff. Yeah. But nope. that's so funny. Yeah, great, huh? Oh, man. All right. So now that the episode is over, we got a few things we want to talk about before we wrap up here today. Yes. So we have new things happening and we are super, super excited. So last week we mentioned that we launched our Patreon page and we want to thank all of you guys for the love and support on there. You can join our Patreon for as little as $3 Canadian a month and we have a ton of fun perks and extra content and this all basically just goes towards us being able to do more, improve and grow. I think a lot of us have this fascination with things like this, but may not have folks to talk about it with. And having like the Discord and the Patreon, it just gives us a place to come together and discuss. And yeah. it's pretty great. And it just, it really means a lot to us. So with all that being said, we want to shout out some of our Patreons in our $10 tier and up. So a big, humongous thank you to Lisa, Brian, and Pink Flamingo 20 And of course, everyone else on there, thank you so much. You guys absolutely rock. Next week, we're going to be getting real uh, horrified. We're going to be getting into the Halloween spirit by bringing you a paranormal episode. And we can't wait. Until then, make sure you don't miss out on the Grim Curriculum news by following us on Instagram at the Grim Curriculum and Grim Curriculum on Twitter. You can also find us on social media. I'm Dina V on Twitch, Dina V IG on Instagram, and Dina V tweets on Twitter. And I'm Ominous underscore Walrus on Twitter and Ominous Walrus on Instagram. And just as a last little bit of uh, housekeeping news, whatever you want to call it, if you guys are interested, for the last five years, um, I've been participating in Extra Life and raising some money for our local children. Children's Hospital here in Edmonton, the Stollery. And this year, Dina has graciously uh, decided <laughs> to join our team. Um, we are stream daddies yeah, on Extra are. Life. So if you go to extralife.org, I guess that's extra-life.org, you can see, see, you can search for our team, stream daddies, exactly how you think it's spelt. Uh, if not, I'm going to have some links up on the socials in the description so you can uh, participate and give your lovely money away for a really good cause. Yeah, and uh, I'm really excited. I'm really stoked to be a part of this. And... <laughs> Uh, I just talked to Charlotte off mic and she has graciously agreed to stream some Phasma with me Absolutely. for a special little fundraiser stream that we're going to do in October. So stay tuned yeah. for that as well. It's going to be amazing. I only stream basically during October to raise money for Extra Life. So I'm going to be playing some spooky games in the spirit of Halloween. I'm thinking some mortuary assistant perhaps at this point. So stay tuned for that. I'll keep you guys updated on the situation. And if you have any questions of all, at all, of course, just reach out to us on the socials we really want to do good we want to do charity yes. work we want to give back as much as we can and uh we're really excited we hope we do well um charlotte knows what she's doing here i have no <laughs> clue so we're gonna see how it goes but i'm uh, i'm ready to raise some money so hey great yeah so as always thanks for listening guys this has been the, the grim, grim curriculum, curriculum.